Okay, good morning, good evening, good night, everybody. Um, now, I think we have uh, a assist time 15 minutes, uh, maximum time 30 minutes. So um, I'm going to probably have to rush through this. Um, uh, I, I'm also presenting at uh, Anton Collinan's uh, Interpretable Natural Language Processing uh, Workshop. Um, and I think I have more time allocated there. So um, if I have to uh, skip over anything a bit too fast, um, you might be able to get more detail at Anton's uh, workshop. Um, but to jump straight in, I uh, want to um, I think I have to share my screen. And here we go. So this is about the vector parser. This is work which uh, I did actually um, about 20 years ago. Um, but uh, it's, it's still fresh. Um, and the central idea was uh, to, in, in contrast to the, the, the um, state of the art, that uh, most uh, uh, work on cognition, trying to find uh, some kind of representation as a compression of the world. Um, the idea was that uh, perhaps uh, we need to consider that uh, cognition is an expansion of the world. And as a restatement, fundamental conjecture that uh, Victor Passer cognition may be an expansion of the world, not a compression. Um, and okay, that that's uh, kind of radical. Um, and but fortunately, in now in 2021, uh, possibly not so uh, crazy anymore. Um, there are actually some uh, green shoots of, uh, of of work embracing it. So um, the Victor Passer was an early attempt to implement this idea. Um, and this uh, technical description, um, which actually I put together um, after deep learning took off, uh, so about also a few years ago now, and uh, an early paper I presented in 2000, um, it's now old, but the uh, central idea is, is still, uh, still not really widely appreciated. Um, so it came out of uh, work I was doing at uh, Science University in Hong Kong uh, between 1994 and 96, uh, attempting to formalize grammar uh, of grammatical errors amongst learners in Hong Kong. So basically trying to um, uh, formalize grammar. Um, and um, the, the, the situation put me in a, in a sort of a unique uh, place where um, I was between, um, i just come out of the, uh, we just sort of ended the second uh, neural network boom um, in the 80s, um, and uh, I, I was very interested in that, so I was very much inclined to distributed representation, um, and, and also there were um, themes uh, in the applied linguistics department where I was um, uh, around a sort of a retreat from formalism in, uh, in linguistics, lexical approaches and uh, corpus approaches. Um, and so there was this tension between machine learning. Uh, so learning, I was attracted to the idea of learning grammar from uh, data, uh, from first principles. But there was also this tension with, with the idea that um, uh, from neural networks that uh, representation needed to be distributed and also themes and applied linguistics. Anyway, so um, I was toying around with uh, learning uh, grammar from examples. Um, and um, the key insight that I that I came up with was that um, there seemed to be some kind of um, what what you got was something which um, strongly resembled sort of a a bottom up uncertainty principle, the tension between um, between representations. You, you couldn't find a, a, a definite representation. That there was always uh, some kind of uh, you, you would resolve one. Um, perspective and it would it would destroy another but um, so very much like a, 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 a an uncertainty principle um, so the conclusion was that uh, that grammar can't be learned there's a tension between different groupings uh, and that produces a kind of uncertainty principle and you could and you and you could find themes like that in uh, in linguistics um, and Later, I, I found uh, going back right to the, the what, what I'd call the, the Chomsky schism in, uh, in linguistics, um, but not understood uh, mathematically in linguistics. Um, so grammar can't be learned, uh, but there's a flip side to that, which is uh, expansion. Um, 
you can't the idea was that you can't you can't compress um, grammar but what it, what that resulted with was that you, it, it, it could be an expansion and that actually that's much more productive um, so we know that there are patterns that uh, that, that, uh, that grow without bound uh, gospel's glider gun uh, is, was the the, the, the uh, first uh, existential proof uh, for that uh, back in the 70s um, but the idea that learning uh, as an expansion still uh, dominates uh, AI uh, even in 21, even uh, 10 years after deep learning. Um, okay, so I'm going to try, uh, try and split the presentation into, into four parts for uh, clarity. I'm going to do a quick uh, worked example of the vector parser. Um, and then I'm going to uh, try and relate that to, uh, to firstly, to the, the, the um, state of the art now, deep learning, uh, neural networks, transformers. Um, and then I'll also I'll, I'll um, look at some of these, these green shoots of uh, what I see as a similar or related work on uh, mathematical representations of indeterminacy, um, which I'm, uh, I'm seeing signs of in, in OpenCog uh, and uh, Bob uh, Koch. Um, and then at the end, I've got a little uh, one more thing. So uh, <laughs> don't go to sleep. Um, okay. Vector parser. So the basic idea uh, is, is is very old. This this it works in the same way as uh, as, as machine learning of grammar. This goes back to the, the, the at least the forties, thirties, um, and this was uh, uh, Zalig Harris, um, uh, and I think there'd be other restatements as well. Bloomberg uh, people were working on learning uh, uh, phonemes, um, uh, American structuralism. Um, and so anyway, uh, but a statement of it uh, um, from uh, Zalik Harris uh, as, as the notion of interchangeability, that uh, constituents of the same type can be replaced by each other. Generally in machine learning, uh, you attempt to uh, compress language structure based on those uh, substitutions. So what I ended up doing was uh, the same as that, just uh, upside down move myself a little bit there to make that um, visible. Uh, by contrast, the vector parser attempts to expand structure based on substitu uh, substitution, so upside down. Same thing, upside down. Very simple algorithm, substitutes, rather than combining as in machine learning. It substitutes for, in particular, it substitutes for pairs of words, substitutes uh, pairs of words with single words, and simply iterates that. But by substituting for pairs of words, you get a preferred uh, order and it forms trees. Okay, so to, to uh, go uh, quickly through a, work, uh, a little work example, um, as a uh, uh, sample sentence, you have sentence here, uh, the White House News Conference Monday. And we're going to try and structure this using substitutions. Uh, so um, start with uh, White House, um, we substitute the pair and uh, by searching over corpora, we find that uh, uh, White House as a pair can be substituted for by um, many things, amongst which we have uh, single words, including uh, words like uh, the sen uh, Senate, um, Earl is a single word, um, JSP, it's, I, I believe the Japan Socialist Party or seller. Um, so you substitute a pair with a single word. Um, similarly, news conference, pair, you substitute, you, you look through your corpus, you find where you can uh, substitute for that pair with single words. Um, and you find examples such as uh, meeting and committee and a lot of others, a lot of noise um, of varying relevance but you find substitutions. And this is what you do with machine learning. But in machine learning, you try and abstract these substitutions into categories. I looked at it from the point of view of saying, well, hey, maybe you can't abstract these categories. You get this tension, this sort of uncertainty principle between different, different clusterings. Um, but perhaps what you can do is you can expand it. 
Okay, so continuing, you've got uh, substitutions for White House, you've got substitutions for news conference. It is single words. You now have two single words, substitutions for White House, amongst them were Senate, substitutions for news conference, amongst them were committee. You can combine those and search for substitutions for that pair. So you search for substitutions for Senate committee, Senate report, and you find that they can be substituted by, once again, we've got the Japan Socialist Party. There seems to be a strong Japanese uh, um, waiting in my, uh, in my corpus, the corpus I was using back then. Um, but uh, that, that's quite nice. You have these, uh, these actually strongly politically related uh, substitutions for Senate report as a pair, single word. Uh, Japan Socialist Party, the, the Diet, and the LDP, which would be the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan. So anyway, political single word substitutes for the pair, uh, Senate report, which is itself single word substitution, um, uh, pairing replacements, a pair between single word replacements for uh, White House and news conference. So now we've got a uh, uh, a, a gloss or a, um, an abstraction of the uh, phrase White House News Conference as the Diet, LDP, or JSP. Um, then the White House News Conference, these, these single words uh, start, uh, combine with uh, the, most things do, the Diet, the JSP, the LDP, and as a unit, these are, are found to combine with um, substitutes for Monday. Uh, one which was found in the corpus apparently was uh, session. So the Diet session um, is observed in the corpus, which um, vindicates the, uh, the algorithm's hypothesis that um, this might be a, uh, a, a good pairwise substitution structuring for the full phrase, the White House News Conference Monday might be the debt session. So it vindicates that order of pairing for that uh, sentence, that structuring of that uh, sentence. And this largest pairwise substitution generates a tree. So uh, very much like um, radical induction, machine learning, Harris's principle of interchangeability, but it substitutes to expand rather than combining to compress. Um, and the, 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 the key thing is that expand, these expanded classes don't have to be global. They can be specific to a given context. You have the specific sentence and you, you uh, do these expanding substitutions and you find a structure. But unlike with machine learning, where you, when you, where you then try and reconcile that globally across your entire language and where I found that you've got a tension between this clustering works sometimes, uh, the clustering works some other times. Instead, you don't have to do that. You have a specific pairwise clustering for a specific sentence um, and that can be unique to that sentence. Contradictions don't matter. Expansion as opposed to uh, compression, everything else is the same as, as basically decades of, of machine learning. Decades of machine learning, which have failed to actually find the grammar. Nobody knows why they assume it's because they're using the wrong parameters. Possibly it's because language simply does not have a global uh, formula, uh, formalization, a single global formalization. Maybe this tension between interpretations is fundamental. Um, okay, so that's uh, just a brief work example. Uh, it's, the operation is very simple. It, it relies on a, a, a simple um, reinterpretation of the problem. That instead of being a problem of compression, it may be a problem of expansion. Um, and you can go through work examples yourself. There's a demo online, intermittently, depending on whether I want to pay for the server on that month. Um, it's up at the moment. Um, demo uh, kaoticlanguage.com uh, but you know remember it's, it's 20 years old um, and I don't know more than one simultaneous user but I'll probably crash it but it's up at the moment you can play with that uh, if, if interested and work through some examples of, uh, of your own um, and there's a website okay so um, that's that's just a basic uh, 
quick run through of, of, of the, the principle of the algorithm and the idea behind it. Um, so to try and put it in, in context of, uh, of, of where we are, where we are in, uh, in 2021, I mean, remember this, this was done, this was done the late nineties. This was after the last, uh, um, neural network boom. It was when neural networks were being found to be inadequate um, and uh, were going out of fashion. By 2000, they, they were mentioning neural networks was, was clear death. You know, nobody was, was doing it. It had been proven. I mean, specifically for language, they were, they were um, neural networks applied to language were recursive neural networks and they, they were uh, uh, proven impossible to learn um, and, uh, and nobody was interested. They, they moved on. Um, neural networks were interesting. Uh, um idea but uh nobody really knew quite how to uh apply it, it didn't, didn't quite work um so that's what was happening in 2000 uh but now 2021 we're actually 10 years into a a, a new renaissance of of, uh, of neural networks deep learning networks went deep they got better and transformers the most recent uh tendency um but so that initial uh, uh, um, thesis idea behind the vector parser was that, uh, that perhaps grammar can't be learned, that it's an expansion rather than compression. So how does, uh, how does deep learning, um, uh, what, what's deep learning's uh, attitude to that idea? Uh, we're 10 years into the deep learning uh, revolution. Um, what is deep learning's uh, attitude to, um, this, well, the idea that the grammar can't be learned, that there's a tension between uh, different interpretations. Um, and they ignore it. And I say ignoring in, both in the sense that don't know it, um, and also in the sense of, of actually ignoring something which is known, but, but people are not paying attention to. Because if you, if you drill back into the history, um, you can find a history of this, uh, specifically in linguistics. Um, and the, the schism which Chomsky created in the 50s in linguistics between the, the, the state of the art until that point in the US, uh, um, particularly with structuralism, American structuralism, which was learning structure from data, from observation, and the revolution that Chomsky uh, brought to the subject where he rejected that. He rejected it for very interesting reasons, specifically for this reason, I think. So anyway, deep learning, it, how does it deal with this? It ignores it. Um, so look at the deep, let's, let's take a step back. We've, we've now got deep learning, we're 10 years into deep learning revolution. Um, why is deep, why has deep learning succeeded? It, it, uh, it ignores this, this idea that, that I was proposing 20 years ago. Um, but it's, it's very successful. Um, so usually, I mean, when people, uh, try to analyze why deep learning works, they say, well, it's machine learning it's because everything's automated um, uh, really but actually that they don't know <laughs> nobody knows I mean the recent the Stanford uh, foundation paper um, I mean it, it, it struck me strongly in, in the abstract to that uh, um, a statement in the abstract to the Stanford paper proposing uh, um, transformer networks as a new foundation for AI and they state we we currently lack a clear understanding of how they work Deep learning lacks theory. Um, so what I'm saying is, is indeterminacy the hidden theory of deep learning? Um, in the context of what I'm saying, that the cognitive structure may be an expansion rather than a compression of the world, um, maybe the reason that deep networks work better than symbolic representations is exactly because they don't abstract a lot. They leave the representation distributed. They, they may not be aware of that. They don't know why the distributed representations work better, but perhaps that's what's happening. Is deep learning moving forwards, backwards? If indeterminacy is the missing theory of deep learning, then learning's the wrong way to go. I mean, backpropagation is used like a, like a talisman, like some kind of incantation. It, it works, nobody knows why. Um, 
even uh, even even Jeff Hinton is is saying, look, it's it's obviously uh, not um, doesn't seem to be correct uh, biologically, but uh, it works. Um, so we we blindly move move forwards with back propagation, trying to compress representations. But as we try and compress them, actually they get bigger and bigger all the time. Deep learning, more layers, deeper, less abstraction. It's like Wow, a, a little, little little parody of, of 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 the idea of these transformers. People look at them and they say, "Wow, yeah, look, so we we get bigger representations, and 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 they do all the stuff we hadn't imagined." And and uh, um, we we let's make them foundation. But hey, we don't really know why. We don't know how don't know how they work. <clears throat> but if if we uh, if if the reason is because. Uh, um, cognition is an expansion, then it's, it's obvious that it explains the, uh, the mystery of why uh, these bigger representations work better and do, and do uh, mysterious things. Um, same principles, just except they expand. We don't have to burn a hole in the planet trying to learn infinity. I mean, if that's, if that's what's happening with, with, uh, with deep learning, um, the reason that they work better is because they're getting bigger. But by trying to learn everything, they, they end up chasing chasing an infinity. I mean, if something expands, then you try and learn all of it. Yeah, you can learn a lot of it, but but if you try and learn all of it, you're just gonna burn a hole in the ground. Instead, we can have structure, but we just have to recognize it's um, ephemeral. Um, what uh, what what Transformers do do very nicely, and, and have this this, this creepy, uh, um, uh, uncanny uh, quality, um, this, which makes people feel that they're onto something. Is um, semantic glosses? They don't. We we don't have structure, so we can't really do anything with them. We can't constrain them. Don't know how to uh, how to um, actually uh, control them. Uh, do logic, but um, they 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 make some uh, fascinating. Uh, um, substitutions. Semantic losses. Well, the vector parser also generates semantic losses. Um, it comes in the vector parser, it comes from uh, successive substitutions. Uh, is that the same as transforms? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure anybody really knows exactly what's happening with, with transforms. Um, we have uh, attention and then we allow it to learn what it needs to make uh, correspondences, which are kind of substitutions for entire phrases, I guess. Um, so I think it's plausible that the same thing is happening. It's substituting and the substitutes uh, generate semantic glosses, um, possibly in very much the same way that the vector parser did it. So the vector parser does generate substitutions. Um, they're, 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 but they're pretty basic, look, I mean, 20 years ago, I was using, I think it was a 40 megabyte corpus. Um, compared to what, what's happening now, I, I looked up uh, uh, Alutha AI, apparently it's a clone of uh, GPT-3, and uses uh, 800 gigabytes. So there's, there's a big difference in the data. But anyway, the vector parser also generates uh, um, uh, glosses. Uh, and, and one of the ones which always amused me uh, was, uh, well, that's all right then, was uh, glossed by the system to be II, sir. Um, and this doesn't happen every time, but uh, we'll just uh, we'll follow through this example just to see how, how that happens. And just let me check how I'm going for time here. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the, the phrase being analyzed. Well, that's all right then. Um, and it's structured by the system. And this is the uh, the uh, substitution um, uh, result for the uh, the, the, the pairing. Um, um, well, that's all right then. Uh, aye, aye, sir. How does it create this? It basically, it has a, a succession of substitutions. It starts with all right and finds uh, pairwise substitutions uh, uh, yes, and it, it basically substitutes yes all the way all the way along uh, and and fun uh, comes to uh, ii um, so here we are all right 
is uh, if you look uh, through the corpus, you find substitutions um, for uh, uh, with OK and yes. Uh, yes, yes. Also substitutes with yes. Yes, everything is uh, very agreeable. Um, oh, yes, uh, substitutes to uh, I, I. And um, uh, there's there's a sequence found in, in the corpus I I sir that's which and that substitutes in the context so you get you get this uh, substitution gloss for uh, well that's all right then to be uh, I I sir so um, uh, I would uh, speculate that uh, this is very much the same thing is is uh, it's happening in in transforms anyway we get semantic glosses uh, in the uh, in the vector parser too just rushing along with the time. Um, so comparing uh, the vector model to uh, transformers, um, the potential benefits, it gives you structure, one-shot learning, no input is different to any other, every input is, is, is one shot, every input is, is new. Um, so it, it just deals seamlessly with corner cases, long tail. Um, it, it actually, because it's creating a new uh, interpretation and it's expanding a new representation for every uh, every new um, context, um, there's a sense of uh, creativity, that expansion, ma making more. Uh, I mean, you can you can draw uh, conclusions for things like free will consciousness. Um, even even time is is like a yeah, succession of objects because it, it finds structure for uh, new things. So it, it's creating a structure for the world. It's a big change. <laughs> um, doesn't need enormous data. Doesn't doesn't need to try and uh, enumerate all the structure in the in the universe uh, uh, beforehand. Burn a hole in the planet doing it. You don't need millions of dollars of compute time to, to do all that computing beforehand. It only generates a structure it meets. As it meets a, a new context, it generates a, a structure um, from its, its uh, historical observations. Um, but it's, it doesn't try to generate everything. Uh, in short, it provides a theory uh, for distributed representation. And theory is decided, undecidability. Uh, so that's the contrast with deep learning. Um, probably the same thing, but uh, deep learning ignores undecidability. Uh, they work backwards the whole time, thinking they're compressing, but actually they're expanding. They're making more layers and bigger representations. Um, it's just they aren't aware of this idea that, that possibly cognition could be an expansion. So the whole time they're moving. Uh, forwards, trying to compress, but going backwards um, and uh, making bigger representations, which is what what works. Um, okay, so um, that's state of the art. But as I said, there's now 2021. Unlike uh, 20 years ago, there are some um, uh, shoots of appreciation for this idea of uh, indeterminate structure, uh, even expanding structure. Uh, it's no longer totally crazy, which is nice. Um, in particular, some work in uh, OpenCog uh, with Adam Space, uh, and also there's uh, um, uh, Bob Koch, there's uh, uh, somebody I came across actually in 2007 doing some work on this. I don't know if he was, I think he's a central operator, he's doing stuff with Lambic calculus, I think. But um, anyway, he's, he's uh, seems to be very actively uh, developing it uh, now. Um, so new pro current approaches which are looking at uh, at um, uh, indeterminate structure. So um, uh, let's uh, let's contrast it with that that recent work and see what what's different and similar. Um, okay, so just to a quick recap, um, the idea that uh, linguistic category might be undecidable was initial motivation for the vector parser. Uh, initially, I, I was not strongly aware of uh, work on mathematical decidability. It, for me, it was it was simply uh, an observation when I tried to learn that I, I got a, a kind of a tension between different um, uh, clusterings of, of observation, which strongly reminded me of, with a, a physics background, of um, uh, 
a kind of an uncertainty principle. It, 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 it felt quantum, um, but I wasn't so strongly aware of uh, results and, and mathematical decidability. Um, anyway, but so uh, what I presented in 2000 was, was looking at it uh, uh, naively as a uh, as just the observation that uh, that um, you got this uh, tension between uh, clusterings and that perhaps we needed to look at cognition as an expansion that the observation might be irreducibly distributed but not it it, it wasn't based in uh, in formalism um, so I had this this, this insight about uh, uh, that, that, um, cognition. Uh, might be um, indeterminate and um, have a kind of a quantum uncertainty principle. Um, but and over, over the years, uh, uh, poking around trying to find uh, um, some uh, uh, basis for this, um, I found uh, analogs in different fields. First one, uh, Robert, Robert Lachlan, um, macro quantum properties, properties of assemblies. He wrote a book, Reinventing Physics from the Bottom Down. It, very much appeals to me. I'm, I'm sort of proposing cognition should, is upside down, or that AI is, is looking at cognition upside down. So uh, Robert Gotham's reinventing from the bottom down uh, is it, uh, it, it, um, strikes a strong um, resonance with me. Um, Hofstadter's uh, Gödel Escherbach. Um, I was talking about this with a friend. He said, hey, that sounds like uh, what Hofstadter was saying. I, uh, I read uh, Gödel Escherbach um, at uh, brought me into fuller awareness again of uh, Gödel incompleteness. Uh, I followed that through to uh, category theory and started seeing parallels uh, um, in, in formulas and everywhere. Um, also stumbled at that time on uh, this, this schism which uh, Chomsky uh, created in, um, in linguistics. I mean, I knew that Chomsky had revolution, revolutionized linguistics in the 50s, but um, in particular, I came in uh, a book by Fritz uh, Neumeyer. Um, I came across um, a discussion of this, which which said that um, one of the key reasons why Chomsky um, rejected American structuralism was that he, um, uh, he, he found, or that he, he pointed that others had found um, inconsistencies when, the, when they tried to learn even phonemes. So Chomsky the, observed this, American structuralists were doing this, they're basically doing machine learning, and they, they also found these kinds of uh, they didn't say quantum light, but they said inconsistencies between the representations they learned. So Chomsky really held that to the uh, to the fire, and uh, he used it. To, he actually destroyed the subject. He he uh, he rejected um, uh, learning. He insisted that, it, that the grammar must be uh, innate, um, and and that was it wasn't the only th only criticism criticism he made of the of, of um, the uh, status of linguistics at the time, but that. That really struck a, a chord with me. That was in this book by uh, Newmark. Um, and uh, also uh, Sid Lamb. Um, I uh, asked him on a, uh, on a, a linguistics uh, email list about this and Sid Lamb came back saying, yeah, yeah. He said, I looked at it too and uh, I wrote some papers saying that actually, uh, instead of uh, in insisting that we needed a universal grammar, we could, we could resolve these uh, contradictions and, and phonemes by, um, by, by recognizing that they were non-linear, that, that, that phoneme as a category was non-linear, um, but that uh, uh, was ignored that the field was going off after Chomsky's universal grammar. But it was it was what I what I what I had seen. It was this this, this contrast and uh, this uh, um, tension that, uh, of unlearnability in, in language. Um, and there's a, a, a very amusing parallel between what Gödel and, and Chomsky concluded about this. So he believed that uh, Gödel actually concluded of his own uh, mathematical incompleteness theory that um, that it, it, it proved the existence of God because if, if maths was uh, undecidable, um, if it was uh, incomplete in itself, then there must be some perfect being outside which was um, ordaining the, the truth. And uh, Chomsky's conclusion was, was very similar. That, that, that if, language when you learned it was indeterminate then there must be some kind of outside arbiter which was determining the truth um, and that could only be uh, for him uh, universal grammar some kind of innate um, uh, language uh, organ in, uh, in uh, evolution so 
So, um, okay, so I'm looking, I'm relating Victor Parser to these new shoots, looking at uh, undecidability, incompleteness, relevance of that for linguistics, um, and just telling a little bit of my story, how I found uh, parallels in, in other domains. Um, and I found them in physics, I found them uh, in, in the history of linguistics, um, I found them in uh, Hofstadt. Um, and now, uh, happily, uh, I'm also finding them in, uh, in AI. So in particular, um, with uh, um, togetherness, Bob Koch, um, and, uh, and ideas of category theory and atom space, you have to rush a little bit. Um, this is progress. In, in 2010, I, decidability was not a factor for OpenCock. Um, in 2010, I was trying to press this, uh, this point of view and I was told, um, clearly there's a lot of work being done in natural language processing, but this is primarily an engineering task. I don't see how it relates to questions of decidability. This is 2010 OpenCock. Um, so now, uh, just the other day, uh, Looking on the OpenCog website, uh, paper, uh, PDF on uh, Mariology uh, in 2010. Um, in the remaining chapters, the sheaf construction will be used as a tool to create AI representations. Uh, whether it's a accurate representation of, is, of reality is undecidable. And this is true even in a narrow formal sense. So this is now something which is uh, coming to prominence in um, undecidability, coming to prominence in OpenCog. Um, so what's, what's the difference between, uh, what, uh, uh say, um, between, uh, these, uh, um, formalisms, these, uh, indeterminate, uh, um, uh, formalisms of, of, um, of structure and what the vector parser, did? well, I mean, they're very similar, um, the categories in the vector parser are sets. Uh, and uh, elements linked to other sets. I mean, there's the, the, looking at the example of the White House News Conference again, um, you've got uh, the, uh, the substitution groupings for News Conference and White House, they're, they're both uh, sets. Is this comp comparable to uh, the, the more recent uh, OpenCog uh, hypergraph formalism? Um, the vector passes generated categories uh, would, would just be uh, uh, graph operations, they, they will surely be equivalent. Um, how the actual uh, uh, combinations between uh, vector categories is implemented may be specific to the vector plaza, but it will be some kind of uh, network operation. Um, so there, there's the combination between uh, um, the category for with embassy and cabinet uh, for White House and uh, row and meeting for news conference uh, generates a new category with meeting. Um, there's a specific uh, substitution path creating structure which the vector parser um, implements, but it will be some kind of um, uh, network operation producing a new set with which doesn't necessarily intersect at all with the uh, operand uh, elements. Even in 2020, OpenCog hinting at the idea of expansion. Uh, also in the Mariology, Mariology uh, uh, PDF, um, uh, Beth just men mentions a brutal composition that uh, perhaps the way things are put together is just the way things are. There's no finitely long answer. There's this idea of expanding into infinity. Even it's an expansion. So, um, in comparison to these uh, new uh, indeterminate formalism um, approaches to AI, what can the vector parser add? Um, okay, I, I mean, I like, I love this recent work. It's these are themes which I was pushing for a long time, and, and it was sort of crazy that, that, um, that they didn't seem to be appreciated. Um, as a criticism, uh, I feel that they they're perhaps a little bit trapped in formalism. I mean, they're, they're the right formalisms. Um, but is formalism the way it should be looked at? Possibly myself being less, less steeped in formalism was a bit of an advantage. I mean, I had fewer qualms reducing representation to simple observation. Uh, also a little bit stuck, I think, some of them in uh, linguistic formalism, naively perhaps. 
Um, I, I think they totally ignore the, uh, the, the, the what I call a, the Chomsky schism um, between uh, uh, which based on what can be learned. Um, so as a criticism, perhaps a little trap, too trapped in formalism. I think the formalisms, these formalisms may be right, but I'm not sure that the formalism itself is a way to uh, solve the problem. Um, if all representation is reduced to a network, uh, why have an intermediate representation at all? Um, you might capture some habitual forms perhaps, um, but that hasn't been where uh, we've been meeting the problems. The problems we've been meeting is with novelty. So we need a general theory which deals with novelty as well. And if you have that general theory, um, then why not just use a general theory? Um, if, if you're going in from, uh, from observation to some formalism, then is it not just a change of basis? You double the work, you, you do a lot of work to get into the formalism, then you have to do a lot of work to get out of the form. Why not just stay with the observation? Why struggle with atom space at all? Why not stop with raw observation? Um, that's open call. Bob Koch's uh, togetherness, possibly even, even more uh, stark, uh, this, uh, um, this preoccupation with formalism. Um, so Bob has a, a kind of a, a quantum formalism. I don't, I, I think he, he traces it back to uh, Lambert. Um, but anyway, um, it, it strongly matches my original insight that the grammar displays a kind of uh, macro quantum quality. I love it. I mean, <laughs> it and he's written this paper, it's, it's, it's great, it's fun, it's readable. Quantum foundation of natural, natural language meaning uh, to a, me a theory of everything. I mean, I think this is right. We're getting to what's happening with meaning, that there's some kind of quantum tension in it. It's, it's been the problem all along. Okay. Quantum theory naturally carries over to modeling how word meanings interact in natural language. Yes. Here's an, uh, here, but, uh, here's a diagram from, uh, from the, the together. It's Paper from the, the paper um, showing how you can draw parallels with uh, um, with, with quantum structure in uh, linguistic structure. I'm sure it's right. I love it. But okay, as a criticism, also with open cog, uh, atom space based on category theory, Koch's uh, um, linguistic and meaning structure based on uh, on, on, on quantum formalism. It's great. I'm sure it's right. I'm sure it's the, it's the way you have to do formalism to deal with uh, cognition. But why struggle with formalism at all? Wasn't it the, the point of my 2000 NAACL paper that observation is a reducibly complex that actually cognition expands? You have to calculate everything from observation anyway, especially in the case of Cog, but, uh, of Koch, but, um Okay, like, I mean, quantum mechanics, we need formalism because we only have access to observation. So if observation is, is quantum mechanical, is, is the tension of truths between one different uh, uh, complex and uncertainty principle, we, we, we have no choice because with quantum mechanics, we don't have any access to an underly, underlying uh, uh, assemblies. Um, but, uh, at, uh, although possibly the Steve Morphin seems to be developing a theory of some, some kind of underlying assemblies uh, as a basis for quantum mechanics. Anyway, quantum mechanics, we don't have uh, access to underlying assemblies, but cognition, we do have access to So why not use the underlying assemblies if that's the real basis? Okay, so uh, summary. Three approaches, summary of three approaches to indeterminate structure in current tech, neural networks, Deep learning transformers ignore it. They don't have a theory. Stanford Foundation paper, we currently lack a clear understanding for how they work. Category theory, uh, deal with it by laboriously encoding into a mathematical formalism and then laboriously decoding other than mathematical formalisms. Also uh, not clear whether it, it really um, embraces uh, uh, expanding structure. Open cog same category theory. Uh, vector parser dealt with indeterminate, stru indeterminate structure by expanding structure from a context at one time. Oops. Okay, uh, so conclusion 
the, uh, so the idea that the cognition was an expansion of observation met a uh, brief sterile ground in, in 2000. Um, it was the first step in a, a direction of pointing to an important expansion, expansion in cognitive representations, but there was little interest in distribute, distributed models period in 2000. I mean, I, I deliberately uh, distanced myself from neural networks because just nobody wanted to hear about neural networks. It was a dead letter at, 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 in 2000. Um, even in 2010, I met uh, resistance to the idea that mathematical decidability had a relevance to language and co cognitive structure. Open cog flatly uh, rejected it. Um, and the, the, um, uh, the bottom line for the vector parser was it was simply not better, uh, immediately better on benchmarks. Uh, there was a little bit of assessment done. Um, this is uh, this this was an assessment done in two thousand and three. I actually presented it uh, at, at, at at Beida, Beijing uh, um, University, in uh, two thousand two. I think late two thousand two. They had a uh, conference, um, and uh, Hu Hu Gorping of iFlyTech, a uh, young chap at the time, is now still at iFlyTech, I, I believe. Um, he he did an assessment, and he found that it was it was it was quite good. It was uh, it is it was a little better than um, than uh, in certain circumstances and some of the symbolic classes he compared it with, um, but not radically better, not perfect. And uh, at the time, it was not obvious how to make it better and what was wrong, what was happening. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, it was okay. It was good, interesting. It got similar results, um, but it simply wasn't. Um, shockingly uh, good enough to attract attention. Um, so, summary, what it got right. Um, the results were no better than symbolic passes, but uh, it was convenient that it could be applied to any language. There was no enormous uh, learning burden, um, corner cases, uh, the sort of uh, creativity idea um, was uh, implicit in it had great potential. What it got wrong, why didn't it produce passes which were markedly better than the state of the art? And this is something I didn't appreciate in 2003. Uh, I think I, yeah, I, I realized it a bit later, about 2005. Um, uh, what I missed was that abstraction into vectors was also abstraction. Actually, I was trying to not abstract and to, to retain observation and generate uh, structure and category as an expansion on observation. But um, the uh, optimizations, which I was forced to really by the, the technology that the computer took at the time um, of uh, abstracting uh, observation into vectors, threw away information that was also an abstraction. What I realized was that vectors also lose information. You need to retain a network to retain full uh, information and observation. And I hope I still have time that to present on that note, uh, my little uh, one more thing, uh, the uh, network theme, the idea that uh, vectors were also an abstraction and that's why it uh, didn't receive better results and we needed to maintain the network, that network analogs, recent work. This is just a little, a quick, a look at what direction I've been working in recently and um, please pay attention because I would love to have some input on this and in particular um, if anybody has access to hardware I want hardware to try and implement it at scale. Okay so for a long time I was looking for a physical analog or actually just a visualization of, of, of these sorts of cross products I was using in the vector uh, parser to uh, demonstrate how it was generating new structure. Okay I was looking for a network analog of a cross product of a vector product. And then I came across this paper and a uh, network to integrate and uh, of integrate and find networks uh, for community detection, detection in complex networks. And this suddenly presented the idea to me that synchronous oscillations, oscillations may correspond to substitution groupings in, um, in uh, networks, in my network substitution groupings, networks in general, but in my network substitution groupings. In retrospect, it was obvious. If you look at graphs of substitution groupings, they clearly correspond to the sorts of groupings that you might expect if you set a network oscillating because shared context will, will uh, 
uh, tend to synchronize the oscillations of the groups uh, which uh, can be substituted for each other. Language sequences, language sequences naturally form small world networks. The network of all sequences uh, in a corpus will oscillate. Feedback is automatic uh, because of interconnectedness. That was one thing I wondered about. Um, really, all you need to do is, uh, is, is uh, add a certain amount of inhibition. Some early experiments on this. Um, so I did some early experiments. I found a little a new, a neuro simulator um, uh, online uh, by a guy named uh, Charles Simon. It's a it's, it's very nice, accessible uh, uh, neuro simulator. And, um, and uh, Charlie did some mods on that to uh, help me uh, implement this. Thank you, Charlie. All credit, have a look at his project. Uh, very cool. Uh, Brains Simulator 2. Easy to jam language sequences into a network. Uh, though the uh, GUI, uh, Charlie's very nice uh, uh, um, uh, network uh, neuron connectivity uh, GUI seems to get very crowded. This was just for a, this was for a tiny corpus. I think it's only at like a thousand words. Look at all the, all the networks. The black, um, the black is inhibition. So the inhibition is, is pretty sovereign over the whole network. It's coming from uh, largely from these uh, green blue um, uh, nodes on the bottom. Taking out the uh, um, uh, the links display so that we can see the nodes. Um, inhibitory inhibitory uh, nodes are green. And what do we get? Uh, so it oscillates. Lovely. I was astonished and, and delighted uh, how simple it was to uh, get this uh, network of, uh, of language sequences uh, to oscillate. All you had to do was code the, the sequences in and uh, inhibit it uh, in the, to the right degree, and um, it gave these lovely uh, oscillations. So oscillations in a network of uh, language sequences. It's just repeating the clip. Um, okay, so in this oscillating network of language sequences, substitution classes should synchronize because they share context. That's the point of a substitution class, um, that uh, substitution class shares context. Uh, and if, if um, sequences share context, they should also synchronize in an oscillating network. How can we observe these uh, these uh, synchronous uh, oscillating substitution classes, uh, possibly with a raster plot? Um, so uh, Charlie did some mods to implement some raster plots for me, and here's an example uh, raster plot uh, for my little toy uh, one thousand word uh, corpus uh, oscillation uh, implementation. So the question is. Do uh, these um, uh, different clusterings of these uh, um, synchronous oscillation, oscillations correspond to um, substitution groupings? And different energies of, uh, of um, uh, synchrony uh, possibly define trees, which are comparable to the substitution class trees in uh, vector parsing. Still speculation, but very evocative uh, for um, to my mind, and um, I really I would really like to try this with uh, a large uh, corpus, a realistically sized corpus, and to do that. I think I need realistically sized hardware, preferably uh, spiking hardware, something I don't know, Intel Loihi. Um, I still think it's still unrestricted uh, beta, but uh, if anybody has access to that sort of uh, hardware, please let me know. I want to try this network oscillation structuring at scale. Thank you very much. I hope I'm not over time and um, I wish you a good day. <laughs>